My name is Melinda Brayman. Um, I'm the warden at the Parnell Correctional Facility. And how many in here have heard of the Vocational Village? So as of right now, what is your knowledge of the Vocational Village? What do you think it is? Or what have you been told that it is? Just to kind of get an idea of kind of what you guys are thinking it is or what information has been passed along to you. Job what? Job creating? Yep, absolutely. What else? Anybody else have any other information that they've heard? So what the Vocational Village is, is it's a skilled trades program that was created back in 2015, and it actually kicked off in 2016 at an Ionia Correctional Facility called the Richard A. Hanlon Correctional Facility. Um, and the director of the Michigan Department of Corrections, Heidi Washington, had a vision shortly after she was appointed to her position that education was the key to success for our prison population. Um, there had been a lot of things at that time that had been uh, canceled or discontinued due to funding and other, other things going on within the department over the years. But one of the things that she was very, very um, passionate about was that education was kind of the key to helping our offenders be successful once they transition back out into the community. And the bottom line is most of our population, between 95 to 97% of the offenders that we have under our care, they're gonna be going back out to the communities. So what our goal was, was what can we do to one, make them successful once they get back out there, but also create a more safe environment for everybody out in those communities, because they're gonna be our neighbors one way or another. We might know some of some people that are incarcerated or have been incarcerated. Um, so not, not every person who's been incarcerated is a bad person. And the offenders that we deal with on a regular basis, they know that more than anything. And that was a struggle that they continuously have to overcome. Um, and that's another thing with this program that I think it gives them confidence. It gives them pride. It gives them something to take ownership of so that when they get back out into the communities, they can feel confident that they can work just like you and I. So that's kind of the basis of the program and how it was created. Um, there's several different skilled trades that, we're, that we offer at the program, and I'm gonna go a little bit more into detail on that here in a little bit. But right now, I'm just gonna kind of show you from an educational standpoint, kind of what we offer to the prisoners uh, in the Michigan Department of Corrections, um, so that you have an idea kind of what we do behind the walls and behind the fences. So our rationale for the department is we want offenders to be well equipped when they go back out and transition back into the communities. Um, there's a workforce that we have with these offenders. Uh, I, I keep wanting to say, forgive me if I say men or gentlemen, because that's the population that I typically deal with, but we do have women offenders as well that we also are creating a, a vocational village for as well. But for the most part, our job is to prepare these individuals for when they go back out into the communities. We offer vocational counseling at the facilities. Um, we have what's called career scope. And what happens is when somebody gets processed through the Michigan Department of Corrections, they come through what we call an intake center. Once they come through that intake center, counselors, employment counselors, meet with them and they talk about a variety of different things and one of the things that they do is they give them a career scope uh, interest and aptitude assessment. Because one of the things in the past that we didn't necessarily take a look at as a department was when an individual came into the department and let's say that they had to have a vocational skill. That was something that was recommended from the, the parole board that they had to get that was required before they could get parole to get back out. One of the things that we never really took into perspective with that process was one, when we assigned them to a trade, do they like it? We basically just told them, do it. This is what's open, you're getting put in there, it's a recommendation, you, now you gotta do it. Um, another thing that we didn't really look at was you know, giving them choices and getting their input into it, including them in that process, how that might change how they take that program forward and how they become involved with that program. because. Obviously, if you and I are told to do something, you gotta do it. Don't, you, you hand ask questions or whatever, you're gonna have that power struggle. 
And that's what we found through the years that we were getting a lot of from these guys is the power struggle over the trades that we were giving them. Because one, we didn't even ask them what they wanted. We just basically told them. So that's where we developed this process. So now they're a part of the conversation. They're helping make decisions for themselves and for their future. Um, after the completion of the career scope, an offender will meet with his employment counselor to review the results as we discussed, um, coupled with their education history, work history, and employment opportunities. And we also now start to look at the county of parole. Um, we always kind of knew they were going to be paroling out to a county, but we never really connected the dots until about five years or so ago that, hey, when we're signing these guys trades, doesn't it make sense that we put them in a trade that they can get a job in the county they're going back to? We don't want to give somebody a welding job and they're going back to a small town that doesn't even have any place that they weld. We're setting them up for failure. And so that's where we started kind of looking, okay, when we meet with the individual, when the counselors meet with them and they talk about their aptitude tests and they talk about what their likes and dislikes are, one of the things that they also talk about is the county that they're going back to and they start to look at the resources that are available in that county. So that when we're talking about what trades they should be placed in based on their interests, we want to pick something that we know they can be successful in when they get back out there. They're not going to struggle to try to find work because it's, it's needed out there in the workforce. Um, and, and that's where the trade path is determined between the offender and the counselor. Now, we offer a lot of vocational programs throughout the department. Um, I'm just gonna kind of briefly go through what we offer right now, and then I'll talk more in greater detail about the Vocational Village and kind of give you guys some information about how that process works. But to start with, vocational programs that we offer are auto technology, carpentry, plumbing and electrical, masonry and concrete, which is a fairly new one, um, commercial truck driving uh, at Parnell where I'm the warden. That's the first facility in the state of Michigan where we've started to offer that program. And obviously I'm not gonna let them drive a semi inside the prison. So we've had to, kinda had to be a little bit innovative in how we you know, develop these programs, but we have what's called a simulator that they can get a temporary permit while they're inside the facility. And then once they get out, we've connected with different truck driving schools that they go for two weeks to get their on the road test. And then they're ready to go. Um, we offer custodial maintenance, food technology, horticulture, uh, computer numeric control machines, uh, CNC and robotics, optical technology, welding, and computer service technology. And the computer service technology is a new program that I'm proud to say we just kicked off in Jackson last week um, for the first time. And it's called, you may be familiar with it or you may not, but it's a program called The Last Mile. And it's funded through Google. And the first facility that it was offered at where it kind of started was in California at San Quentin. So if you kind of look it up online, you'll see some great information about that program. And that's what we've brought to Michigan, which there were several other states that wanted to also bring that program to their, to their state, but we were selected as one of the few to branch out to. Um, not saying that they won't go to those other states, but right now, the direction that our department is going, especially with the Vocational Village and how we're doing that with the reentry and our returning citizens, they selected us as a pilot site in Michigan for us to offer that program. And I believe once the women's facility gets their vocational village up and running, that program will also be offered there as well. Um, so those are pretty much the trades. The only ones that are not a part of a vocational village right now are the custodial maintenance, food tech, optical, and that's it. Everything else is at either the site in Ionia, the vocational village in Ionia, or the site in Jackson. And then this just kind of, I'm not going to go through every single trade because it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but this is auto technology and you have it in the handouts as well if you want to get more information. I also provided over on the table a, a pamphlet that talks a little more in detail as well about the certifications and credentials that these guys walk out of with these, with these programs. Carpentry. Electrical. Plumbing, 
masonry and concrete, CNC machine tool robotics, commercial truck driving, CDL. And this just gives a little bit of information, the part of our screening process for how we determine um, individuals for our CDL program. Now, this is something I will tell you has been a eye-opening experience for me. All of the things that I have to consider and the department has to consider when it comes to truck driving. Um, they have to pass a medical, a medical screening before they can be considered uh, eligible for this program or even to be a tr truck driver. Um, so we didn't really realize that until we got involved with the first class of students that came in. The other thing that we didn't really realize because we weren't really thinking about it at the time is that they had to have a driver's license. So we started the program because some of these guys have been down anywhere from two years to 25 years. So some of them may have a driver's license. Some of them may have to, you know, renew their driver's license through the mail. And some may have never had a driver's license. So we weren't really thinking about that because we've never really thought that far ahead before. Um, and that's something that we had to kind of incorporate into this program going forward. And it's kind of been one of those things with the Vocational Village where we just kind of improvise as we go. We're very flexible with the program because we understand that needs change. Um, our communities change when the employers come in and meet with us and take tours and see our guys and see our programs. We're constantly, you know, changing and revamping our curriculum to meet the needs of the employers out in the communities. So that gives you an idea of what the truck driving screening process is. And then our computer service technician, uh, that's gonna be primarily coding for that program. And like I said, we're only just under two weeks in operation for that. Custodial maintenance, welding, and then now the vocational village. So, one of the things that we've always done forever with the, vocation, with, with the Michigan Department of Corrections is we've always offered vocational trades to our population, to our incarcerated individuals. One of the things that we decided with what we wanted to do in a new direction is how can we change those vocational programs to be more meaningful to not only the offenders in the program, but also for the employers in our community prospective partners, how can we meet the needs of both of those groups? Um, and, and the bottom line is to make these guys be successful when they get out, transition back out to make our community safer. That's you know our ultimate goal. But how can we do that by incorporating the trades skills into our vocational village? So where the vocational village is a little bit different for the department um, as opposed to any just any facility, is one, to be considered for the vocational village, you have to be within one to two years of your release date. And we look at different factors. They can't be, mis they gotta be misconduct free. Um, we don't want somebody in there that has behavioral issues, obviously. Um, also, we, you know, we talk to the individual, the vocational and employment counselors talk to the individuals before they sign what we call a contract and accountability sheet. Um, for them to participate in the program. And the other factor is we wanted to make sure that when we meet with these guys, they're gonna go five days a week to this program. Whereas before they might've went two or three times a week for a couple hours here, a couple hours there. And one of the things that we, as we evaluated some of our recidivism um, information was one of the things that we were really failing as a department in was employment rates for our guys when they get out and our women when they get out. So we really had to figure out what are we doing wrong? What can we do better to help these guys get a leg up to be successful when they get out or at least give them the opportunity to be successful because we can't force them something they got to want to be. And one of the things that we determined was through the years, if we gave these guys or these women jobs inside the facility, say a porter job, we'd let them work for 20 minutes to an hour. And then they go back outside and play basketball or walk around the yard or do whatever. 
And we kept scratching our head when they get out, wondering why they can't do a full-time job. Why don't they ever show up? They probably do their 20 minutes or an hour and then they go back outside. You know, we, we couldn't figure out until we started really evaluating our processes and hey, how are we really doing this? That many of our guys and women have never worked before, especially the younger ones. They don't even know what a work ethic is. They don't know what benefits are. So we decided to build into this program, not only are we gonna do the skilled trades five days a week, but we're also gonna make them go like a full-time job. So they get up and they go over there from six o'clock in the morning. They stay there until about 2.30 in the afternoon. And I, I'm, I think uh, the Ionia facility is very similar. The hours might be different, but the time frames pretty much, they go six and a half hours a day, basically. And the only break that they really get other than bathroom breaks is when they go to lunch. And they go as a group to lunch and they come back as a group. Um, and by doing that, we built in, you know, to them that work ethic, because now they got to go there every single day. And once they start getting involved with the program, they like it. They like going over there. They like the break from the unit. They like the break from the other stuff going on in the facility. And they like the instructors. They like what they're learning. They're starting to get confidence with themselves. They're starting to get, you know, a little hopeful that, hey, maybe I can do this. Um, and so that program has really helped us get from where we were tied to where we're going um, with that mindset of simulating as much of reality as we can, because there's only so much we can do behind the walls, you know, to simulate what we do on a daily basis, because they don't have their freedom like we do, obviously. Um, the other thing that we do from the front end is we ask them when they come into the program before they sign the agreement, that they have to give up some things and they got to be willing to give up those things, such as if they're going from six in the morning till 2.30 in the afternoon, and then they have core programming besides that, say cognitive therapy or substance abuse programming or anything like that, when else would they be able to do that but after that? So from two o'clock, 2.30 until possibly 8, 8.30 at night, they might be doing core programming. So one of the things that we kind of stressed in the beginning with them is you're going to have to give up some stuff like yard time, visits, you know, and things like that. And at first, you know, there was a little bit of resistance, but the fact that we were asking them and making them, having them be a part of the conversation really helped the program get uh, momentum, I should say because they, they all started kind of signing up for it. They were agreeing to the visits, not, not having visits and things like that. Because like, again, like we explained to them, when you go out and you get a job, you're not gonna be able to just leave your job to go do what you wanna do over here because there's something you wanna do. You gotta go to work and you're gonna have to give up some other things. You can't just go outside and play basketball when you feel like it. So those are some things that we've instilled into the program along with the soft skills. Um, and that's kind of what makes the village a little bit different. We also keep them all in one housing unit. Um, we kind of wanted to make it a, not necessarily a therapeutic environment, but an environment where there's a support system for themselves. They're all like-minded individuals with the same goals and objectives of what they want to do and what, what direction they want to go. So we wanted to kind of foster that by keeping them separate from the rest of the population as much as possible, just so they can focus on that because there's a lot of distractions that can take place, especially in a facility. Um, and so by keeping them together, not only does it kind of keep them away from some of those distractions, but it's also kind of helped from a mentoring standpoint. Because now that they're all in the same housing unit, if you have individuals that come in to that housing unit that are just starting in a program and you've got guys that have been in the program for a while, now they can mix and talk about what their experiences have been. And if somebody's struggling, this guy over here can come over and say, well, this is what I did to get past that. Hang with it, you'll get through it. You know, things like that. So it's kind of like a mentoring and it's something, you know, we deal with that on, on our jobs every single day. We work with other employees, you know, and the other thing that we instill in them is just, you don't have to like everybody you work with. You're not gonna like everybody you work with. Does everybody in here like everybody they work with? No, especially if you're a supervisor, right? I mean, we have difficult people that we have to work with every single day. And that's something that we instill in them as well is you may not like that individual, but you gotta work together. You still gotta work together as a team.
And so that's building that soft scale piece into the program as well. So what I would like to do now, um, like I said, the first site was in Ionia and we started out there with welding, CNC, carpentry, plumbing and electrical and automotive. And we also had horticulture, but it was kind of, that wasn't in full bloom when we first initially started the program back in 2016. But the clip I'm gonna show you um, is actually a clip from State of the Union with Governor Schneider, where he has a special guest that he um, gives acknowledgement to at the State of the Union. Now let me share another success area though, and this is an area of success you would not normally expect to hear from, but they're doing wonderful work and we should be proud of them, and they don't get enough accolades. And I hope you really stand up and give them a big cheer tonight, and that's the Michigan Department of Corrections. They're transforming how our prisons are working in terms of making us all safer and giving opportunity to the returning citizens that are part of that process. In March 2007, there were 51,554 people in our prisons. That was the all-time high. In September 2017, the population fell below 40,000 for the first time since 1993. And how do you do things like this? One of the most positive national initiatives in corrections is right here in Michigan. It's called the Vocational Village. It began in Ionia in 2016. It expanded to Jackson. We have further plans to expand. It provides our returning citizens the opportunity to give skills for a great career. It's a win for all of us. The vocational village needs employer partners. So I'm encouraging any private employer or any employer out there to join this program. I want to recognize the Grand Rapids area in particular in West Michigan. They have over 20 local employers that have partnered with the vocational village already and are helping ex-offenders directly from prison and I want to share with you a story. One graduate is Salvador Gutierrez. He was in prison for drug crimes. He enrolled in the vocational village in Ionia and completed all four tiers of a computerized machining course. He earned four nationally recognized certificates. When he finished the program, he just didn't stop. He became a tutor and mentor for new students. He's out now. He's successfully employed at Transmatic in Holland and doing great. And Salvador is with us tonight. Salvador, please stand up and let us recognize you on your success. So that was a pretty big deal for us. Um, and just to kind of give you a little background on Mr. Gutierrez, uh, Salvador there. He was one of our first students, uh, first official students that went through the program, one of our first graduates. But along the way, he was a very difficult individual. Um, he was one that after two weeks being in the program, constantly was stopping me on rounds, stopping the warden at the time, because I was a deputy warden at the time when we opened up the first village. Um, he was asking the warden and I both, as well as the instructor, if he could change his trade because he just didn't want to do it. He didn't think he could do it. And one of the things I sat down with him one day and I said, give us three weeks. You've been in it, you know, and at that time you'd only been in about a half, about a week and a half. I said, give us three weeks because this is such a, you know, expedited program, you, you know, you're going to learn a lot. And after three weeks of going, that's 15 days, you'll have an idea if you can do this or not. And so he was like, okay. I'll try it. Well, after that three weeks, he loved what he was doing. Um, he started to see, because initially when he first started and when I spoke to him, he said, you know, the reason I didn't like the program was I didn't think I could do it because there's a lot of mathematics in it. And he never really had exposure to a lot of that other than in high school, but that was years ago. Um, so one of the reasons he didn't want to be in that program was the fear that he would not succeed. And he's never, he indicated he had never had a support system that kind of encouraged him to try. You know, it was always your failure. You're never gonna be able to do that. In fact, he said, you know, he had some of his family indicate to him when he told them that he was in the program and what program he was in. Well, why'd you get in that? You can't pass that. You know, so that was his support system. So after the three weeks, he was in the program, doing well most of the time, but we still had some bumps in the road where we had to, 
talk with him and you know the instructor is always scratching his head man i don't think he's gonna he's gonna cut it i don't think he should stay in the program so we kept working with him and working with him and by the time he got ready to graduate from the program he was our best student and he was the one going over and helping everybody else that was coming into the program that was struggling because he struggled so he was paying that forward which is you know awesome especially in the setting that I work in every single day. You don't always see that. You don't see the positive side of things, but you started seeing that human interaction between them in that environment. And it was quite awesome to see, especially this individual that before he got in this program was a very difficult person at times. Um, then he got out of the program, he graduated. And because the program was still fairly new, he had quite a bit of time before he was gonna parole. So. He still remained in the same housing unit with the students that were involved in the program, but he was kind of sitting idle. And it got to be like three weeks before he was gonna parole out and he came to us and was like, I don't know that I'm gonna remember everything because it's been a while since I've been in the program. And we got to thinking, yeah, he's been out for at least two, three months. So we developed another part of the program where when we have individuals that complete the program sooner you know, and have that much time before they're going to parole out that we needed to do something to get those skill sets fresh and back in, in full swing so that when they go out, especially if they had a job going out, that they would be capable of doing that. So we developed a program where for the last two weeks before they go out on parole, they come back over kind of for a refresher course and they work with the other students that are in the class, almost like a tutor. Um, and so that, that seemed to help. And Mr. Gutierrez was one of the first ones that we kind of did that with. That was kind of our pilot thing. And he did that. And then when he got out, he actually got a job. And as you can see, was doing very well. So that was one of our first success stories. So that's one that's kind of near and dear. And then for the governor, which he had came to um, the Ionia facility, Richard A. Hanlon Correctional Facility, and did a tour of the Vocational Village before he did the State of Union so that he knew exactly what the Vocational Village was. And he walked around, shook hands, talked to the guys. Um, and really asked a lot of great questions. So it was pretty, pretty awesome experience for the department to get that recognition from the top. Um, and it's kind of helped motivate us to keep going as well, that support that we constantly receive. Um, the next video, I'll show you in a minute here, but from MTU, which is the Ionia facility, we then because things were going pretty smooth and we were getting quite a few employers, at that time we had about 100 employers that were taking our, our guys that were coming out of the Vocational Village. Um, we then decided, the department decided that we needed to open up a second Vocational Village. So they were looking for a site to do that and Jackson was chosen for that site. Um, and of course, I had quite a bit of experience with the Vocational Village and with the resources involved with that program. So it was a logical fit. I interviewed and I got the job and that's when I moved down to Jackson about two and a half years ago. At that time, that program was not up and running. It was just a vacant space going through construction where we were going to put the Vocational Village and start that program up. Now the differences between at the Jackson site and the Ionia site was when we started the program in Ionia, they had already had the trades up and running and the classrooms were already in set. We just kind of made it a Vocational Village. In Jackson, it was a vacant space under construction, so everything had to be built out from the tool cribs to the space to the machines, everything that had to be purchased for those, um, as well as the construction phase of it. So it was a lot, a lot of work, but well worth, well worth it. Um, speaking from an employment standpoint, what we did, which is kind of unique as well, is years past, the department was kind of secret squirrel. We didn't want anybody to see what we were doing inside just because the fear of people might say that we're doing things not right, just like anybody else. A lot of times you hide things, one, because you don't want to share the information you have because you don't want people to steal your ideas. But then two, you're afraid that you might get people to look at something and then go out and say that you're doing this or you know bad publicity or whatever. And so it was kind of always like a sacred thing that we never let anybody come in and see what we were doing. It was kind of you know hush hush. And when Director Washington took over, and, and um, Director Hines as well, before uh, Was Ms. Washington took over his position, um, they kind of started opening up the doors more. And they saw that it was beneficial for us to be transparent with community members. 
and with our community partners, the employers. So what we started doing at the Ionia facility, which helped our pro program substantially, was we started inviting in, in our employers from around the Grand Rapids area, Muskegon area. We even had some people come in from Detroit, Flint, and walk through the vocational village. And our purpose for doing that is one, we wanted them to see what we had to offer. Two, we wanted them to see the types of skills that these guys were learning and um, what machines they were working on, that it wasn't just one machine that they shared or, you know, it was, it was state of the art stuff. It's stuff that's out in the rest of the real world sites and stuff. So we wanted, we wanted to invite people in to be able to see that because that speaks a lot more than me just telling you, hey, yeah, we use the same, we use the same equipment you guys do. Believe me, we do. <coughs> you gotta see it. And so as the employers start coming through, a lot of our employers that have come through um, see the benefits and see the potential if you're willing to kind of open up to the possibility of taking a returning citizen. So one of the things that we did do um, is we did a reverse, what we called down at Parnell after I got there, we did a reverse job fair, which is a little bit different. Everybody's been to job fairs where you go around to the tables and all the information set out. Well, what we did, instead of having the prisoners kind of walk around and, and seek out the employers, we took our guys that were 90 days from going home, the ones that are kind of on our target um, radar, so to speak, that we're trying to get placement for, for jobs. And we had them get their resumes around and we set up tables outside of each trade and we had them set out there and the employers went to them as they were going through on the tour. And they kind of looked at, they had portfolios and things like that that were set out that they could review and see the work that they were doing, like for a carpentry, you know, they were seeing the sheds that they were building for Habitat for Humanity, some desks that were being built, some framing and stuff like that. And then the individuals had copies of the resume sitting right there and the inv individual was right there too. So if they had questions, everything could be done right then. And so it was a very positive experience. Um, the employers really liked that, the fact that we did it that way. Um, and they could choose to go to the table or choose not to, you know, but it was, it was, it was a great process that we kind of developed. And I think going forward, that's kind of how we've been doing our job fairs at the facility when we have people come in. And there's a news article or a news broadcast where we had um, them actually come in and film a little bit of that job fair. We also had uh, a guy from, he was a prisoner in California, Titan. He's uh, through CNC. He opened up his own, once he got out of prison, he opened up his own shop and he's pretty notorious now. And he makes like $20,000 just to speak at events throughout the United States. So um, we were able to, with co uh, community partners in the Jackson area um, for CNC places, they all put in money, donated funds, so that we could have this individual come speak to our prisoners, but then also they were able to invite people in from their companies to hear this this individual speak as well. So it was kind of a cool event. So you'll see just a little bit of this. Nicholas Pugh is getting out of prison in eight days and he already has a job waiting for him. Pretty ecstatic about that, you know, coming home from prison, a new start and everything like that, plus having a job lined up already, taking a burden off things. The job offer to drive semi-trucks came at today's job fair at the Parnell Correctional Facilities Vocational Village. The village opened last year and trains a select group of qualifying inmates in auto repair, truck driving, manufacturing, and construction. Today, dozens of local employers came to learn more about the program and to recruit workers. Very impressive. Rob Olson of Gypsum Supply Company says his company has hired more than 20 former inmates and they're looking to hire more. I think uh, work ethic for one thing. Uh, number two, I think we find that people are very thankful for the opportunity we've been giving them and they're very loyal. It's giving us a, a mission within our community to, to play a role to give people a second chance. A big part of today's event was a speaker who went from a prison cell to owning his own company. Titan Gilroy is a former boxer who served three years in prison for assault. He spoke to prisoners about how he built a small manufacturing business into a multi-million dollar company. 
stressing success after prison is more than just getting a job. So I wanted to let them know that it is a hard road, that you have to have consistency and you got to have that passion to go out and actually put the work in and actually do a good job for whoever you're working for so you can be successful. Pew says making plans for the future gives inmates a lot of hope for a better life. That's a you know big factor in the recidivism rate, you know, not having a job. So it's definitely a relief, you know, that I have that opportunity. Here for you in Jackson, Aaron Dimick, 6 News. So pretty cool stuff um, that's going on right now. One of the, I've been in the department 23 years. My dad worked for the department 28 and a half years at the Michigan Reformatory in Ionia. I've worked at seven different facilities. Um, and I started out kind of, I didn't start in the custody ranks, but I worked with custody as an intern. And then from there, I kind of went through the housing and program side of things. But I started at the Michigan Reformatory where it's a higher custody level facility. And you kind of, what back then they said you had the worst of the worst. And um, we started doing programming with that population when I was there. And as, you know, and I was young, naive, you know, I knew a little bit about corrections because of my dad, but not a lot. I was, you know, a little bit naive. But as I kept doing the programming with them, with these particular individuals, I personally started to see changes in these individuals as we worked with them through these programs, such as cognitive therapy. Um, we did what was called STP strategies for thinking productively back then, um, where it gets them to kind of stop and think about what they're doing, the choices that they're making, why they're making those choices, some of the triggers that they're looking at. And it really, you know, was kind of an amazing thing to kind of see these guys start to have things click. And I kind of shifted at a young age from looking at them as just convicts to now people. And, you know, I wanted to do my part. I actually am one of the few in the Department of Corrections, if you ask, had intentions of going into the Department of Corrections. I actually went to college to be in corrections. My goal was actually to be a deputy warden because some of the internships, I did two internships while I was going to college and while I did that, it was something that kind of intrigued me, but I also saw a need there and I didn't, I felt there was things that I could do to kind of help our system and to, you know, just do stuff different than how we've always done it. And what we've always done is kind of been just lock them up and forget about them. And then when they go to get released, you just say, good luck didn't provide vital documents, didn't provide any type of certifications or anything. We just basically said, you gotta go here to get your driver's license. You gotta go here to get your birth certificate. You gotta go here, you gotta do this, you gotta take this. Who wouldn't get frustrated, especially if you've been down for a while. So those are some things that early on, I kind of wanted to, I, I wanted to get involved with and kind of be a part of changing the mindset. And through the programming aspect, I kind of did that, but if I would have told you in 1997, when I first got hired, or 1996, I guess, that I would be putting a tree inside of one of my buildings, inside of a prison, or that I would be teaching prisoners how to use ropes and how to climb, I would have said, you're crazy. And I have had the unique opportunity to be a part of a program um, in collaboration with DTE and the IBEW Local 17 down in Detroit um, develop a tree trimming, the first of its kind, uh, line clearance and tree trimming program. And that kicked off this year in July. Um, it's a pretty amazing program. There's a desperate need, as most of us know, when we lose power, it takes a while to get our power back on. Well, that's because they need workforce. They need people and they can't get people, you know, to, to take these jobs. And one of the reasons is it's hard work. It's very, very hard work. It's very physical demanding work because you got to use your body and arms and things to climb. You got to be physically fit. And so they've had a hard time getting the workers that they need to keep that workforce going. And so one of the things that they decided that they needed to look at was what workforce out there aren't we tapping into? What resources are available to us that we could use to fill the need for our workforce? And they started to look at our vocational village students in the Department of Corrections because we have all of these guys 
and women sitting inside these facilities getting ready to eventually go out at some point, why not invest in them in their training and get those that want to work, train them while they're there, while they're just waiting to get out, use that time to train them so when they get out, they don't have to go through the school, they don't have to go through the accreditation process, they can just go to work. And so that's where the collaboration uh, this last year with the Michigan Department of Corrections and DTE Foundation, as well as the IBW, kind of got together and started having a conversation. And from there, it kind of just blossomed and went pretty fast paced. I remember back in November of last year, I got a call from the director saying, OK, so you've heard about this tree trimming program and climbing trees and stuff. And I was like, yeah. And she said, what's your hesitation? I work in a prison. I'm a warden in a prison. Of course, the first thing that I have to be responsible for is I don't want anybody to escape. We're not going to give them ropes to go over, right? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you have some hesitation? But because I'm part of this process with the vocational village and stuff, it was something that I just had to kind of wrap my arms around, my mind around, and just kind of open up to the possibilities and think, well, why not? We have the capabilities to safeguard things. We can make things work if we really put and invest the amount of time and effort into it that's gonna help us be successful going forward. So with that being said, the next video I'm gonna show you is when we did our grand opening um, with DTE with our line clearance and tree trimming program and Governor uh, uh, Whitmer was there to do the grand opening with us. And this was on July 9th of this year. We at the Department of Corrections are very excited about this new tree trimming program at the Parnell Correctional Facility. We've had the opportunity to teach a variety of in-demand trades. For us, the recognition of a company like DTE that came to us and said, we have a need and we think that we can work together and create a partnership that benefits everybody. From what I hear, a lot of times when inmates are released, they go right back into the same kind of lifestyle they had that brought them here in the first place. So if they have something to give them a way to actually make money, give them a skill to provide for their family, they'll be a lot less apt to go back to that old lifestyle they had that brought them here. So for DTE, we as a company can be part of affording that second chance. You have to learn the skills, you have to have the discipline, uh, but we should give them that second chance. A criminal record should not be a lifetime sentence of unemployment. The hope and the opportunity that is in front of us, that's what is happening here with a program like this, and that's incredibly exciting. DTE's foundation has made this incredible commitment, and I think that we are going to see wonderful returns for it. There's a shortage of tree trimmers because of the nature of the job. What we're doing here is very, very physically demanding and very, very dangerous. I see the drive and determination in their eyes as I speak to them about the opportunities that are coming their way. And that's exciting for us because we really want to help them get a start in life again. Some folks make some bad decisions early on in life. I'm a full believer in second chances. This is our chance to really help them get off the ground. We're going to insert them directly into a Department of Labor approved apprentice program for line clearance tree trimming. I'm scheduled to be released uh, April 7th of this coming year. I was hurt in 2009. I hit uh, my, my left wrist with a top and saw and uh, spent about a year and a half on heavy opiate based pain meds and embarrassingly it uh, spiraled out of control into a, an opiate addiction and I went from a husband and a tradesman and a father to somebody with his hand in a robbery. You know, I have a beautiful family who I let down. It's an understatement to say I let them down. I got six beautiful children. They looked to me and relied on me and trusted in me for everything and I dropped the ball. You know, we, we sit idle a lot in prison and to be able to put your hands on tools and work and to feel like maybe a, a classmate instead of an inmate is big for us. The feeling I have when I am up in the air climbing the poles, it makes me feel like I'm at home because it's something I have done before I came in and it makes me feel away from being locked up in prison. So being up there is just a sense of freedom to me. 
the program is going to help a lot of people to an industry that could open the horizon to what they want to do. What this program means to me is the fact that I get to impact some of these guys' lives. When they leave here, they're, they're going to go somewhere and do something with themselves. And I will have taught them a trade that will allow them to do that. I dream of having my own business one day, a family-owned and operated landscaping tree trimming business, to have everyone in my family to have a comfortable life to live and to be able to achieve something, to have a legacy behind me. This program does give me hope to, to, to finish up the right way, get out there and maybe finish strong and provide for my family, my kids, and get out there and, and prove myself a man worthy of trust again. So pretty remarkable stuff to see in a prison. I've never seen anything like it before in my life. And it's the first program for tree trimming ever inside a prison. So it's kind of groundbreaking. So the potential and the possibilities, if you just kind of open up your mind, things are possible. You just gotta be willing to take a chance and, and do the impossible. And that's kind of what we tell these guys, you know, especially when they think they can't do something. As you could see from some of the testimonials, they're very positive, they're very confident, they like what they're doing. And as long as you like what you're doing, how can there not be success in there? You know, it's all about choices and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that they're never gonna do anything wrong again, but they're doing, they're making choices for themselves. We're giving them opportunities Employers are coming in, speaking directly with them, doing job interviews inside the prison to hire, and we're giving them opportunities. Um, one of the other handouts that I had over on the table there, I don't know if you saw it, is a brochure um, that the Michigan Regional Council of Carpenters and Millwrights put together. They have partnered with us, with the Carpenters Union, and they have been heavily involved with recruiting our guys um, to get them employed through the union. And it's been working out really great. Um, the guy on the back, if you see, I'm gonna show you a video here in a minute where he's actually at work and he's gonna give a little testimonial, but he was in, I believe, for armed robbery. And he was down for quite some time and he's doing fantastic. Um, in fact, I've seen him several times just since he's been out at different functions where we're talking to employers or, you know, I was at a CAA conference down in Detroit and he was one of the speakers for the department to talk about his experience of how he went from being incarcerated after committing that crime to where he is now, where he's being successful, he's taking care of his family and he's a productive citizen. So. Um, Lots of good things going on. There's lots of potential, lots of possibilities. Something to definitely kind of keep your eyes open to if you're looking for different things. Um, we're always open to if there's ever a time you might want to come for a tour to see kind of what's going on a little more in depth. If it's something that you think might be something you would be interested in, please get in touch with me. I have cards over here. Um, but I'm going to show you this next video real quick and then I'll finish up with some tax information and then we'll kind of do question and answers, if there's any. And from what I hear, that's difficult these days to get people to show up and punch in on time. That's one of the main things I hear from employers that come through on tours, will they show up? So, any questions over that video before we move on? Uh, we offer resume workshops, um, not only through the Vocational Village, but also through the department as a whole, um, just so that when these guys walk out the door, they have that information ready to go when they leave. Um, usually we start working with them six months before the earliest release date. Many of them, because they have cellmates or friends um, inside the facility that are working on them before that, they start working on them before that as well. And by the time they get to that six months, they pretty much have a a pretty good start. Um, but typically we, as the employees, kind of start working with them about that time frame. Um, we cover resume development, interview skills, job search, and application skills. And actually we just began a program um, two months ago 
in Jackson, and it's called the Molly. Has anybody heard of Molly? Let me see here. Molly Interactive Software. Have you guys heard of that? It's through the University of Michigan. And basically what it is, is it's an intensive interviewing skills program. So they actually record themselves doing interviews from the computer and then they critique it with themselves and an instructor and then they do it again. And as they progress through that, they can do the interview as many times as they want, but they do 15 different types of interviews and critique them. And, and once they get through the first one, then they go to the next one and so on. And we start that program about six months before their release date just so they're getting those soft skills on the types of questions and things that they're gonna be asked when they go out and they start interviewing. <clears throat> certificate of employability. Um, the goal of the certificate is to provide returning citizens with documents that help them secure employment. Um, this is kind of like a, a certification that they've been misconduct free, that they've done great while they've been in the system, um, being incarcerated. They've completed a career tech education program within the MDOC, and they've done the work keys assessment and score, and they scored at a silver level or higher. Um, not everybody receives these, but the majority of our vocational village guys do when they walk out. And that's what it looks like. Workforce development, so we have what's called a black file. It's our workforce development file. And pretty much it was mandated by legislation that when an individual walks out of the Department of Corrections that we provide them with a workforce development file of everything that they've done since start to finish since they've been in the department. So that they can take that with them and use it as a resource. And that includes vital docs, um, birth certificates, social security cards, uh, we used to have a process where we start when we started realizing that the vital docs was a huge uh, problem when these guys were getting released because we weren't doing it all the time. A guy came to us and said, I need a birth certificate. Yeah, okay, filled us out. And then we'd send it in and he'd have to pay, I think, I don't know how much money, $45 or something like that. Nobody would do it because these guys, one, don't have a lot of money when they're incarcerated. Um, and two, a lot of them weren't taking the initiative because they just didn't know. So that was a problem that we fixed. And now we, before anybody gets released, they have to have at least a state ID or, um, or a driver's license. We have the uh, SOS mobile unit that comes into our facility once a year. Uh, we do about 100 driver's licenses while they're there, um, state IDs. And then we also renew driver's licenses by mail and all of that stuff we do before they get released. And when they walk out, they will have a black file with all that information in it when they walk through the door. And we also keep an electronic copy of everything because we've learned through experience early on that sometimes these things get lost. So, um, and we didn't have anything because we didn't keep a copy electronically. We gave it all to them. So now we do keep electronic copies so that if anything is needed, we have that information at our resources. which I already talked about the vital docs. We are employer, employee driven. We're looking for the right person, the right job at the right time. And that's kind of the motto of our program right now. Um, it talks about the work opportunity tax credit and it's a lot of information, it gives you some, it gives you the websites that you can look up if it's something that you're interested in. We do have employers when they come through that hire our guys that ask about this information. It's pretty, um, it's an easy process from what we've been told. And you can receive, I believe, a max of up to $2,400 tax credit. Um, somewhere it said 9,600, but I'm, I, you'd have to look at the website for sure. But we also have a bonding, a fidelity bonding program as well, where um, you can get up to $25,000 bond with an incarcerated person that you hire. As long as they've been hired for over six months, you commit to a six month period. And that basically ensures you or your company for like if anything gets stolen or if anything willfully gets broken, things like that. It's just kind of like a, an incentive for you to hire this person. So my name is Todd Chaffee. I direct the Calvin Prison Initiative, and this is a program that started in um, June 1, 2015. 
and we offer a BA in faith and community leadership to 20 inmates a year. We take 20 inmates in a year. It's a five-year program. We are currently in our fifth year, so we are equipped to handle 100 students. <clears throat> After they're graduating with their BA, which we'll have our first graduates this May, we then will send them out in other facilities, other prisons, and they will be leaders. They will implement academic or life skill or ministry opportunities for inmates in prisons. And the goal here is that we want to help transform prisons from the inside out. So since we started our program in 2015, uh, I think we were there and then the vocational village started in 16. In 16. Yeah. And so we realized this is a great partnership with the MDOC and with two major programs in the Ionia prison. And very shortly thereafter, some of our students got excited about the opportunity, not only for the Calvin program, but for an opportunity to help guys in the vocational village. And so they began to volunteer their hours to tutor guys, for instance, who were on the CNC machine and needed some uh, algebra or mathematics. And before we knew it, we had something going. They also were housed, as uh, Warden said, in the same housing unit. And so our guys would share things they were learning in classes with vocational village guys. They would become mentors for them at times. Uh, they would become friends with them. And a community started to form. And so we found that this was inspiring to both groups, the vocational village guys, the Calvin guys. And we began to see things change in the housing unit. So there's one story early on that I love. Um, in a prison, in a housing unit, uh, in this case in Ionia, the unit was built to house 120 inmates, one inmate per cell. Now it houses 240, two inmates per cell. Pretty crowded, about six by nine. And at times the housing units can get pretty loud, a lot of activity here and there. And after several months of our program starting, I went into the housing unit and asked the officer at the desk at the housing unit, I said, how are things going? He said, I don't know what you mean. I said, well, how are things going? He said, you mean like here in the housing unit? I said, yeah. He goes, well, there's nothing going on. I said, now, well, what do you mean? He said, well, after the Calvin guys started, they were studying all the time. And the other inmates began to keep it down so that these guys could study. And he said, so now I feel like the Maytag repairman. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the call, but it never comes. And he said, honestly, my job's kind of boring now. And I said, well, is that good or bad? He said, oh, it's good. It's good. <laughs> so all of a sudden, we had 19 students who were studying all the time, and they began to influence the culture of that unit along with the guys in the boat uh, trades. And all of a sudden, you go from a typical housing unit that can be kind of loud, uh, kind of active, yeah. shall we say, mm -hmm to quite quiet, um, very orderly, to where all of a sudden a uh, security officer who has lots of experience, say, in these housing units, says it's kind of boring. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. In 2018, um, Warden Burton, well, actually it was this past January, but he was telling me about, he wrote his final report for 2018 for the prison, Warden Dwayne Burton, and he was mentioning to me that he goes, you know, uh, last year, 2018, the prison only had eight major incidents. Eight major incidents. Now, you need to know what that's compared to, right? So I thought, well, is that good or bad? He said, oh, it's quite good. He said, normally we'd have about 150 major incidents in a year. And now we have eight. So when you think about the impact of programs like Calvin or the Vocational Village, on the prison itself, it has a dramatic impact. In fact, <clears throat> uh, MTU used to be called, by the prisoners at least, a uh, gladiator school. Gladiator school. And I'm assuming that most of us don't want to go to gladiator school. Now, it's just the opposite. Now, if you were to walk into uh, Richard Handlin MTU, uh, you'd see flower gardens, you'd see vegetable gardens, and when we have visitors, like we will today, because we have our convocation there today, this afternoon, and we'll have some outside visitors join us, 
They literally walk in and say, oh my, this looks just like a college campus. And indeed it does. And it begins to have a feeling of a college campus. And when your environment begins to change like that, it is that has an impact on how you see yourself, others, and you begin to change. So we've seen tremendous change uh, at the Richard Hamlin Prison. And it's because of this partnership between Michigan Department of Corrections, an institution like Calvin University. Uh, we have other schools that are starting to step into other prisons, Montcombe Community College, Jackson yeah, Community yeah. College. And so we're having more and more <clears throat> organizations and institutions saying, you know what? This makes sense to us because we all have a stake in doing incarceration well. As Warden said, over 95% of all locked up folk right now in Michigan will one day get out. And so as uh, Warden Burton at our facility likes to say, who do you want to be your neighbor? And so we all want good neighbors, but that takes effort, that takes a community, and so we feel like we're on to something. Uh, we've been really, really excited at Calvin University for the opportunity for this program that Heidi Washington has really helped uh, make happen over the last four years. We are hoping to expand our offerings. So when a guy enters our program, after 30 credit hours, he will get a certificate in faith and community leadership. After 30 credit hours, he'll get this, uh, 60 credit hours, he'll get an associate's degree. And then after 124 credit hours, he'll get the BA. We are currently right now looking into expanding our associate degree offering. So again, we take 20 students a year. We hope within about a year that we'll be taking 40 students a year. They will then earn their associates. And out of that group, we will select 20 to go on to receive the BA. As more and more uh, colleges and universities begin to offer programming in prisons, our hope is that a network <clears throat> will begin to form a consortium of schools and that eventually, if you think geographically about Michigan, there'll be a college program opportunity in all the kind of different regions, if you will, in Michigan for prisons. Now, <clears throat> we have to realize the impact of education in prisons. The Rand Corporation, which is a nonpartisan think tank, they basically study significant social problems. After studying them, they offer uh, social policy advice to lawmakers and policymakers. The Rand Corporation did a meta-study of the impact of higher education in prisons, it's about 15 years ago, and they said for any higher education in prisons that's of a significant sort, on average, you lower recidivism by 43%. So nearly half. Recidivism is the rate at which when a prisoner leaves prison, in three to five years, <coughs> does he or she come back? The goal is to keep them out. Education, at the very least, they showed, can lower recidivism by 43%. If an inmate receives a college degree, recidivism rates drops to 13%. If you receive a college degree and a one-year master's degree, it goes below 5%, and in many cases, like in New York State, it will go below 1%. So the Rand Corporation concluded <clears throat> education is really a key to solving our mass incarceration problem. They also showed now, you folks are business folks, they also showed that for every dollar spent on education, you will save four to five dollars in incarceration costs. Anybody have any idea how much we spend in Michigan per year on incarceration? And you may not say. <laughs> anyway, just over $2 billion. One-fifth of Michigan's operating budget goes to incarceration costs per year. On the low end, the average price to house an inmate per year is about $34,000. It goes up if it's higher custody, if there's health care issues, that sort of thing. Now, <clears throat> if I told you that we're spending per year just over $2 billion on Michigan roads, I'd say, how are we doing? How's our roads? Last thing I read, I think we're the second worst state in the country with roads. So as citizens, we have to ask, what are we getting for $2 billion a year? Could we do better? And we can. And so we're starting to see programs 
uh, like Warden Brayman and Warden Burton and Heidi Washington and others are promoting, we are starting to see institutions like Calvin College and other universities and college step up and begin to address this, <clears throat> not simply for the inmates, but for the common good, for all of us. Because we all have a connection to this, we all have a stake in this, if for no other reason, because of your tax dollars. Now, we're at a place where we're hoping we can find employers and other groups and organizations in the wider society to kind of join in and help out because now we feel pretty confident that together we can truly address this problem, if not solve the bulk of the problem. We won't be able to help everybody, but we are convinced we will be able to help the vast majority. So we're excited about this. Calvin uh, University is excited about the last four years, entering our fifth year in our program. We've had a great relationship. Uh, <clears throat> Warden Brayman was at uh, Ionia MTU as a deputy, so she was there for the startup of our program. We hated to see her go, uh, but we knew why she was going, so we were happy about that. And uh, we're excited about all the future possibilities. So I want to thank you <clears throat> for taking the time uh, to listen uh, to the three of us and to kind of get some insight and uh, some, uh, we hope, inspiration and vision uh, for what we can do, certainly as the state of Michigan. So thank you very much.